Hey everyone, welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I want to talk about Dasha Drindic's novel, Canzoni di Guerra, translated from the Croatian by Celia Hawksworth and published by Istros Books. This translation was published just a few months ago, but it came out originally in Croatian in 1998, which means it's one of the earliest novels of Dasha Drindic. And if you happen to be unfamiliar with the works of Dasha Drindic, I strongly encourage you to become familiar with them. She's a writer that I admire so much because she's able to just perfectly blend literary fiction with modern politics and history in a way that is so effective and so few other authors have done it as effectively as she does. She writes these documentary novels that force you to gaze into these historical atrocities, then forces you to consider why they're still relevant. She makes you ask questions like, why didn't I know the extent of these atrocities before? How could these possibly have happened? And most importantly, could these events happen again? The answer to that last question is, of course, yes, it could. Which is exactly why Drindich puts it in front of your face and forces you to gaze upon it. And to call her novels novels is in some ways an insult to the amount of historical research that she does for all of her works. At times her novels read like nonfiction history books with just the thinnest veneer of fiction and fabrication. And in fact, a blurb on the back of the book from the New York Times, that's all it says. It's by uh, Parul Segal, uh, but she writes, this writer does not tell stories. She had flagrant contempt for them, those cozy bourgeois talk chicks that belong to a safer time when retreat from the political was permissible. Her books are contraptions intended to produce a series of psychological and somatic responses in her readers. And I usually hate reading blurbs in the back of books because they usually don't do that much, but I find that statement to just be very correct when it comes to Drindic. Drindic isn't so interested in fictional invention, imagination, or originality. She's interested in the power of fiction, the political and social and cultural power that fiction can wield if put into the right hands. And her hands are the right hands. Like W.G. Zabald, Drindic is interested in what we might call documentary fiction, in which she focuses on recapturing the historical memory that we've at best neglected, and at worst, purposefully forgot, either because it was covered up or it was just too difficult to live with. Either way, Drindic seeks to get rid of the fog of this historical amnesia. This novel, Canzoni di Guerra, is a kaleidoscopic novel that brings together voices from across nations and generations. It's maximalist in some ways, despite its very, very slight page count. You'll find in here details about the adoption process of adopting a cat in Toronto, the history of the Vietnamese pot-bellied pig, and tons of long footnotes which cite both historical and literary sources. But there is a central character, a young mother named Tia Radon, who, along with her young daughter, Sarah, uh, live in Toronto, basically in exile. They both emigrated to Toronto from Croatia, uh, sort of in the middle of the 90s, to escape the Yugoslav Wars, which is something that she shares with Dasha Drindic herself, who did very much the same with her young daughter. And so much of this novel is simply our narrator reflecting upon her identity as a croat living in Canada and trying to reconcile these various competing identities within both herself and within the larger immigrant community in Canada. She does research, she reads books, and she tries to set history straight. But as is common in most of Drindich's books, what this book looks at most directly are two historical events and their ramifications, both filled with some of the worst atrocities ever committed in Europe, World War II and the Holocaust and the Yugoslav Wars in the 90s. And so not only is she driven by this attempt to recover the lives lost, a project she shares with tons of authors like Primo Levi, W.G. Sebald, Tadeusz Borowski, etc. She's also driven by recovering and prosecuting through her novels the perpetrators of those same atrocities. She's obsessed with the fact that proper justice hasn't been served to the perpetrators. And so her books are filled not only with lists of victims, but of lists of perpetrators. In Canzoni di Guerra, for instance, there are these lists of these perpetrators, many of whom escaped to the Western world and sought refuge there, many of whom settled in Canada and perhaps spent a few years in jail for 
the, the crimes they committed before peacefully dying at home in the arms of their loved ones. They murdered hundreds, if not thousands, of innocent people only to be accepted into Canadian society. And she goes through these lists of these people with footnotes and all. In both instances though, both in recovering the victims and in recovering the perpetrators, she's criticizing a kind of cultural amnesia where people are so eager to move on and away from these tragedies that they forget to process and prosecute the perpetrators of those atrocities. And therefore they never fully heal nor fix the problems that led to these acts taking place. But not only does this book criticize the monsters who led these atrocities, but it also criticizes places like Canada and the US for both their complacency with these events and their ineffective treatment of refugees from war-torn countries. A character at one point says, some people thought they were coming to the promised land while others quickly realized that there were no promised lands. And then another character, just a few pages later, elaborates on this and says, When I'm angry, I'm very clear-headed, but that's not good for the family. The children feel the tension. Everyone's always rushing, rushing. There's no peace. It's all like a bad dream. It would never have occurred to me that something like this could ever happen. Never. This is an exodus from one country to another, and the differences aren't great. Here we sleep peacefully, there's no shelling, but we're waging a different war, a war in the soul, a war in the head. Why did we come? We thought Canada was a country of great possibilities. I don't know why no one told us the truth. And so for these refugees who are still trying to process the past, Canada really isn't a safe haven for them, nor has it ever really been. She, she tells this one story of this ship the St. Louis, that in 1939 was full of, I think, 937 um, people, mostly Jews from Germany, who were trying to escape to North America. First, they went to Cuba and were refused. Then they docked in Florida and were refused. And then they went to Canada and were refused again. And so they had to return all the way back to Germany. And I'll just read to you how the story ends. Of the 937 frantic and tormented people who had set off on the journey by sea, 907 returned. The others died of dysentery and other diseases, or they jumped off the deck in the harbors of their temporary stay in hope that when they swam into the new country, it would accept them. Final tally, three quarters of those who had embarked for a better future on the 9th of May, 1939, later disappeared in camps. And she goes on to explain that Canada has a history of this, and they were one of the worst at accepting uh, refugees, especially during World War II. And so our narrator is fascinated by all of these different peoples and countries' histories and how they have all sort of convinced themselves that they're right of that history. And so obviously she's most angry with the fascists, but she's also quite angry with Western democracies and how they whitewash history. And now even in these democratic societies, um, immigrants, no matter how educated they are or whatever, are still constantly marginalized and taken advantage of. She comes to the conclusion that I quite like at, at one point after relating all of this of, of, about the treatment of refugees in Canada, and she just says that Orwell is naive reading these days. Our narrator, Tia Radon, who is quite similar to Dasha Drindich in a lot of ways. They lived very, very similar lives, but I'll leave aside that, that messy issue for now. But Tia Radon is quite rightfully, uh, misanthropic, or at the very least, skeptical of the idea of the, the progress of the world, so often touted by modern philosophers like Steven Pinker, for example. She reminds me a lot of one of the narrators from a Thomas Bernhard novel or something like that, just throwing haymakers left and right at people on the political spectrum from left and right. But Drinjic and her narrator never fall victim to a kind of false neutrality or anything like that. After a section which briefly elaborates on the rationale of uh, Antin Pavlich, the fascist uh, leader who founded the Ustasha and attempted to ethnically cleanse Croatia of Serbs, uh, Drindic just writes, I did not research further because all that fascism, that nationalism, that xenophobia, all those right-wing groups yesterday and today are all nothing but a pile of shit. They always were 
and always will be. Now don't you see why I like Dringit so much? And so this book really does a lot in its rather slight page count. It moves between a personal account and this more polyphonic universal account. And it looks at both the resistances to the Ustasha in the 40s and to the sort of war that immigrants within Canada are still waging in their own heads. It's encyclopedic at times. The footnotes of this book give it the effect of a dissertation at times. But at the base of this novel is an individual trying to recapture their family history. And our narrator Tia brings in all of these letters that, for instance, her father wrote to Josip Tito and other communist leaders who, in the 1940s, led a very, very fierce um, rebellion against the Ustasha, a very fierce resistance at least. That reign of, of Tito changed into something entirely different and Dredge touches on that as well. And our narrator also brings in these, these diary entries from her mother who was imprisoned by the fascists and writes all of these entries about how we need to turn to communism to counteract fascism which again had a bunch of problems with it, but she's exploring the rationale behind these choices. But this is all to say that Tia talks at length about how her family has this very long history of being anti-fascist and how she herself is no different. And I should note that this book isn't all doom and gloom. The moments in the present between uh, Tia and, and, and her daughter, Sarah, are often very lighthearted. They, there's a scene where they go to try to adopt a cat and they have to go through this whole kind of process to do it. And it's, it's really funny. But for me, the most powerful parts of this novel is its careful documentary fiction and how the Canzoni di Guerra is a song of war, an elegy to those lost and a rallying cry to those who survived and their descendants to not grow complacent. And it isn't just a reflection of these long ago wars, but a very present war that survivors and their descendants are still waging in their own heads. Even if it seems like at times that the society in which they live have entirely forgotten about these events. And it's also about the ongoing war that anti-fascists, more so now than really ever in the past 20 years, are still waging. I deeply wish that Drindich was still alive because we could really use her pen today. So I'm not sure if Canzoni di Guerra is the best place to start with Drindich. Nor do I think that this book is by any means the best that she has to offer. I think some of her other much longer works are a bit more effective at what they're trying to do. Canzoni di Guerra is more messy than her other books, and her other books are quite messy as well, though not necessarily in a bad way. But I still think that this very short book is very worth reading. If you're scared of politics in your fiction or under any illusion that art and politics should always remain separate, then Drindich isn't the author for you. If, however, you want to read an absolute firebrand who takes shots at people and institutions across the political spectrum, though primarily one side, and does so with a righteous anger that is urgent, impassioned, and most importantly, justified, then you should give Dasha Drindich a read. I think her songs of war are worth being heard. But for now, thanks for watching.